Uh, this is this is the under 1400 class of this class and uh, when I was driving here I was mad okay because you know, I'm always mad so what happened was whenever I teach there's there's the way other people teach and there's the way I teach other people prepare stuff and then they show it and the class ends okay I prepare stuff and then I show something else because I'm like wait what about this and then I go off on a tangent and the class is confused. Then we start talking about world politics. Okay, so one time I was teaching a class and it was the greatest lecture ever because I was teaching the class. Class ended. And then a friend of mine, he, he told me like, oh man, I watched that lecture, but obviously you were just reading what you were saying. Like I was like, oh, you're just reading this and it was a good analysis. And I'm like, what? So I never, that, that would insinuate that I prepared stuff, which he knows better, right? There's no way I prepared anything. So I was like, what are you talking about? I was just talking. And he was like, really? Okay. Now to prove my point, uh, I've never met you. Uh, I think your name is R something, Archer. I don't know who you are. And you, I just know somebody with the same name as you, but I don't know who you are. So what we're going to do is we're going to vote. Okay. I'm going to show three games that I played in one year, but you're going to pick the year. And then I'm going to find three games I played that year and tell you all about them with all kinds of variations, what my opponent was wearing, what he smelled like or she, okay, how tall they were, how ugly they were, etc. So we're going to do the 90s today because I want to go back in the day with Ben. It's something I used to do in St. Louis back in the day with Ben. I mean, now we'll do back in the day in Atlanta. Uh-huh. Right? Yes. Okay. So name, somebody name a year from the 90s. You can't do it? It's too hard. You! 1996. 96, what do you think? 1997? Seven, what do you think? I like 92. You like 92? Sure. 92 was my best year. Right. 92 and 94 were my two best years in chess. Right. Now I can't pick Archer is because he's a show. They're like, oh man, you and Archer prepared this last week yeah. and you have all these games already. I never met you. Yeah. I didn't know what you said, 92? Yeah, nice. Thanks. Year. It was your best year. Or second well, year. 92 and 94, I played real well. Yeah. I don't know why. That's okay. In fact, in 92, that's the year I moved back from Belgium to Michigan. And I have a funny story about that. I played a tournament in Michigan. It was one of my first after I moved back. It was the East Detroit Open, I think because East Detroit changed their name to East Point. Okay, I assume, I don't know why, but I assume because like had Detroit in the name, they didn't like that. So now they're East Point. And they really need Detroit in their name because probably Detroit's a step up from East Detroit, if you know what I mean. But anyway, so I went five and zero. Oh, that's a good score, right? Yeah. And I won like a couple hundred bucks, I guess. And I gained three rating points yeah. for going five and zero. Oh. One of the guys I beat was 2300, but he was unrated. He was from Soviet Russia, right? And he was on, it was his first tournament in the US and I beat him a really tough game, we we're both four and oh. And he got a 2300 rating, but I think I got like no rating points for beating him because he's unrated. Okay, and his son was also about 2200, but he didn't play in the tournament, I don't think. Okay, anyway, let's go Ben Feingold, that's me. We'll do a search. We're gonna look for three games, 1992. 19, is that right? Yes. Okay, hopefully I won them. All right, so this is the games from 92 that are that I have, that I played, that are in my computer. Probably there's more, but I don't have them. All right, I have to find games that I like. Okay, this one, I had a funny checkmate at the end, so let's look at that. By looking at the name of my opponent, even though the game was played, what, 26 years ago? Is that right? Is 92 20, I don't know. Shoot. Yeah? Yeah, that's about right. Okay, so 26 years ago, by looking at my opponent's name, I remember the cute checkmate I played, right? What do you guys, let's, let's ask you, what's your name? Shruti. Who? Shruti. Do you remember anything from 26 years ago? And if not, what's your excuse? I wasn't born then. Terrible excuse. <laughs> There's a Simpsons episode where Mr. Burns decides to go look at the old stock ticker. And he's like, let's see, where did I leave off? 1929. He goes, wait a minute. The market crashed. Why didn't you tell this? Tell me this, Smithers. And Smithers says it was 25 years before I was born. And they said, that's your excuse for everything. Okay. So 1992, this was one of my funny checkmates against Jenny Skidmore, who I'm still friends with. Okay, I was black. So we'll flip the board in case Mike Comer watches the video. And if I remember correctly, it was an exchange French defense where we castled opposite sides. 
right? Now, if you played chess 26 years ago, you remember that, right? I would not, no. Right. And are you 26 yet? Yeah. yeah. He, he's laughing, so he's a lot more than 26, man. <laughs> no, I would have guessed late 20s. Yeah, it's like I, early 30s. Early, yeah, close yeah, enough. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was like I was white, and maybe it was the King's Indian. I don't know. All right, so exchange French, right? Good memory, right? And then I castle queen's side, and she castle king's side. Okay. So I remember that. I remember playing her, and I remember checkmating her in a really cool way. And I've shown this checkmating pattern in, in videos I've made. Okay, now, I normally don't play the French defense, so I don't know why I played it. I don't know. And um, I know that if you don't want to have a boring draw, which I don't, you castle opposite sides makes it really interesting. Now, I have a funny story, because I like stories. All of you have heard of, that means they haven't, Anna Zatonsky. The look on their faces is priceless. You have, right? Yeah. Okay, Anna Zatonsky has been one of the top two rated women in the U.S. for, I'll say 20 years. It's probably been less than 20 years because she moved here less than 20 years ago, but I'll say it anyway. She's lived in the U.S. about 15 years. Actually, she just lives in Germany now, but that's, she still plays for the U.S. And Anna Zatonsky, who's currently married to Grandmaster, um, I, I, I know him, he's a friend of mine, I can't think of his name, man, harsh. I could draw a picture of him, that wouldn't help. He's a German Grandmaster from Latvia. And she lives in Germany with him and they have kids, but she plays for America, it's very confusing. But he plays for Germany. Friedman, D Daniel Friedman, the, their favorite Grandmaster. He's like 26, 60 feet, days. he's pretty good. Anyway, she was married before him to Volodymyr Melnikov, and he, was a, he had no USCF rating, and his first USCF rating was 2,700, but he was like 2,100 strength. But it was his provisional. Okay. okay. Anyway, we had a tournament in Ann Arbor, and her and or her husband, I think her husband was going to Bowling Green University in Ohio, which is about an hour from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So they came up to our chess club and tournament and played in the tournament. In the last round, there were four people, if you can call them people, with a perfect score. Me, Anna Zatonsky, yeah. who's her husband, and Nate Solon, who you've never heard of, he's 2300. So the, the legal pairings was I play Nate and she plays her husband. And we were like, well, we don't want to do that. Should we switch the pairings? Like, no, that's okay, you can do that. They didn't care. Now, if we switch the pairings, all the colors don't work. And if we don't, the colors do work. And she was like, no, we'll play each other. We don't mind. And I'm like, all right. Now, I beat Nate in a very suspicious game. Okay, I was worse. We figured they would play like a 10-move draw because they're married. They played an exchange French. So we're like, all right, here comes the 10-move draw. Then they castled opposite sides like me and Jenny and tried to mate each other. And he checkmated her. Then like two years later, they got divorced. <laughs> Right? You agree, Shruti? Yes. See, she agrees. How old are you? Three? Eight. What? Yes. I was kidding when I said three. I thought I was like ten. You're eight? Yes. Solid. All right. And what's your rating? Four thousand? I don't even have rating. Seven thousand? I don't even have rating. What, what kind of excuse do you have? Uh, now, you play chess online. Yes. And you have an online rating. I win. Yes. Man, I got her quiet. What's your online rating? Eight thousand? No. Okay. Anyway, so in the exchange French, it sounds boring, but if you cast opposite sides, yay, you get checkmated. Okay, let's checkmate each other. That sounds like fun, right? That sounds like, that sounds yeah. like a horrible plan. No, it's a good plan. Both sides get checkmated. That yeah. sounds like a horrible plan. Yay, look at me. I'm Sandra Oh. Pooh, look like you. All right, so my attack's getting pretty close to her king. I don't see her attack. Maybe I have my division check. Right? Yeah. Okay. So H3, putting it in H. And then what did I do? I don't remember what I did. It was 26 years ago. If I play bishop H3 and she takes it, then what do I do? Then bishop F5 check is slightly better for white. Slightly. I was just kidding. It's a lot better. If I take the knight, she plays the intermezzo, bishop f5. You like that? Yeah. What? Yeah. Like if I take this, you think she's going to take back, but she plays bishop f5. And I cry like a grandmaster. 
Man, there's not there's not a book here, Cry Like a Grandmaster. Now, Joe doesn't believe this, but there is a book, Cry Like a Grandmaster. Is there? Yeah, it's in the next room. Archer will back me up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm guessing I played Bishop E6. Yay, good guess. Okay. In this position, obviously, white's threatening to take, and then bishop f5 again. Always play king b8, even though that's not the rule, it's king b1, but close enough. By the way, I'd like to explain to the class, see this rook here? Yes. You don't do that. Can that rook move? No. No. If you're going to play rook e1, that was the wrong rook. The other rook is the right rook. That rook doesn't make any sense. You might want to play knight f1 and or bishop f1, especially bishop f1. So rook a e1 doesn't make any sense. Okay, now she played knight b3. And now, if I play the archer sacrifice, <laughs> there's no bishop f5 check. So the knight's hanging. And her knight left the other knight, so the knight's hanging anyway. So I'm guessing I did that because knight c5 looks annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now if knight c5, queen here looks pretty good. No? Looks good, no? Yeah. All right, so takes, takes. Now I'm threatening this because I said so. Yeah. If you don't like that move, I have another threat. Like G4. That. Then the knight can't move because queen h2 made. So, man, my attack's looking pretty good. Now, if he, she played the other rook to e1, yeah. she would be able to play like bishop f1 later and I'd resign. Okay. So she played knight c5 because I attack you, you attack me, except you don't attack me. Right, and this is the beautiful mate that I remembered from 26 years ago. Okay. And I showed it in a puzzle. The question is, Archer, do you remember me showing this? Yes. Well, there you go. Yeah, so Joe knows the answer. So how you got mate? Yeah, how did I mate her? You ever watch the Lakers play basketball? Have you? Uh, maybe back when Kobe was playing. Okay, and then when Phil Jackson was the coach, what kind of offense did he run? Triangle. There's the answer. Make the triangle. So you have to get a third. Piece. No, you make a triangle with your piece. You gotta do make. You gotta do that. Rawr. We could call it a carrot, but they don't know what a carrot is, so you can't do it. They don't know what a triangle is. I'm not exactly sure. Archer. Queen G4 check. Yeah, you play queen G4, queen F3, queen G4, queen H3. And Hooray! Queen H2. Yeah, it's a, it's a carrot. Okay, and then there's only one legal move. Then there's one legal move. Then there's one legal move. There's one legal move. And then mate. Yeah, that was cool. That was like the coolest thing I did that year. That was says Detroit Championship Michigan. So that was in the Michigan Open, I guess, in Detroit. I know where Detroit is. Now, I have a funny story about that. I know where that tournament was. It was in a Holiday Inn, and it's on Ford Road. If you cross the street, cross Ford Road, it's not Detroit anymore, it's Dearborn. Okay, that's the border. Now, Dearborn has a big mall called Fairlane. It's still there. I wouldn't go there unless you're like armed. Anyway, I'm in Fairlane, possibly during this tournament, possibly. And I was at some store, and I was paying for some item, and I said, I was talking to the cashier and I said something about Detroit. I'm playing in a chess tournament in Detroit. And her response was, I've never been to Detroit. But she was in a mall across the street from Detroit. She couldn't handle the Michigan yeah. left turns. What do you guys call them up there? Yeah, the Michigan left turns. Yeah, Michigan. Yeah. Well, I mean, she's working a block from Detroit. So she's been to Detroit. Yeah, I've never been to Detroit. Like, well, you've never been to Detroit. Like, if you walk that way, you're in Detroit. Like, walk 10 feet. Okay, and that might have been during this tournament. Okay, now Jennifer Skidmore, as you all know, when she was like 13, 14 years old, she played in the World Youth, representing the U.S. Go, whoever we are. And then uh, she was president of Michigan Chess Association. You know those crazy shirts I wear that are tie-dye with the Knights? Those are her shirts. She makes those shirts. Yeah, also she just had a baby a month ago. Yeah, and she's 43, so truth hurts. You know who had a baby when they were 43? It was his mom, him. Yeah. So the, every, everything's the same. Okay. I had a baby when you What? Oh, not related to our discussion. Okay. Eric Torman, he changed his name. He used to be Vadim Semekman. Now he's Eric Torman. Just anglicized. It was something. Yeah. 
Okay, that was the crazy draw. I drew that. Okay, this game, if I remember correctly, I won 11 moves and he was 2,100. Oof. Do you beat 11, do you beat 2,100 players in 11 moves? Yes. You do? I might lose to him. Ryan's like 1,700. Okay, let's see if I'm right. Yay, I'm right. The 11 move game. Now, do you remember 26 years ago how many moves your games were? That's crazy. It's crazy like Fox News. You. I wasn't born. No excuses. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something else about this game. It was played on my birthday. When's my birthday? You should know. Yeah, you know why he knows? Other than he lives in the same house as me? There's another reason. It's coming up? No. My birthday is his half birthday and vice versa. He's March 6th. I'm September 6th. Cool. Now, I don't want to remember a lot of birthdays, so my birthday is 9-6, and my son's birthday is 6-9. Now, my son was born in Europe. It's true. It's true. Not him. My other son. He's my stepson. My son was born in Europe, so you're supposed to write his birthday 9-6, <laughs> and my birthday is 9-6. I don't remember a lot of stuff. I'm like, look, woman, you're having the kid on June 9th, and she's like, all right. Yeah. Right? Is that what happened? That's the day before my birthday. Exactly. I knew that. That's why you're in my class. Now, when Karen and I got married, I can't remember all the people I've married and all the all the dates of anniversaries, right? Yeah. So I said, okay, Karen, when's your birthday? And she told me November 23rd. So I said, okay, we're getting married December 23rd. Then I can remember. Right? That all happened except I made most of it up, but the dates are still correct. Okay. Right, Archer? Yeah. Now you know the anniversary because you know you know your mom's birthday. It's a month later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now when my daughter was born, I don't want to have like a lot of big celebration. It takes too long, right? It's annoying. So I said you got to be born on the shortest day of the year, right? What's the shortest day of the year? Twenty second of December. Wow, very close. Twenty first. But yeah, that's yeah, very good. Winter solstice. Yeah, that's when she was born. Because I can't don't have a long birthday celebration. Okay, anyway, this is Michael Caberto, or as he calls himself, MK the Great, which is very funny because of your mom's email address, KB the Great, and this guy's MK the Great. He calls himself, I'm MK the Great. So I never told your mom that. Okay, so this is on my birthday at the Michigan Open. I've said this before in lectures. On my birthday, I have a really good record. The reason is my birthday is near Labor Day, right? And Labor Day is when all the states have their state championships, usually, not, not Georgia, most states. And I live in Michigan most of my life, and the Michigan state championships, not too strong. So on my birthday, I was killing it. Conversely, I spoke to Joel Benjamin, because I played him on his birthday, and boy, did I beat him. He said, I always lose on my birthday. So the truth hurts. Ooh. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't play. Okay, I'm white in a Slav, and he made a mistake on move four if I recollect the game. I think I could show you the game without pushing the arrow. Right? You could do that, right? That's unbelievable. And when I say I think I could, I know I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he played Bishop F5, which I've been telling people is a mistake for 40 years. Okay, right? That is? What? Well, yeah. I That's thought like, I thought like Bobby Fischer. No, nobody's ever played that. Oh, I guess it's if the Bishop was going the other way, turning uh, what? F2 pawn. But I'll stop talking. I don't know when. No, but you're you're taking something you know and you're putting another position and they're, yeah. they're different. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So now the way to refute this is to trade on d5, which I did, and then the obvious move. Anybody? Yes. What? Exactly. Knight. <laughs> Who? Knight h4. That's not a bad move. Now the point is. When the bishop goes to f5, you're undefending b7 because I said so. You, queen b3. <clears throat> now, normally you could defend the pawn with your queen like a thousand ways, but then you're, un you're undefending this pawn. So actually, the best move will shock you. I don't want to tell you because you'll be shocked. Should I tell them anyway? Yes. Hey, you Home, don't listen. Do this. La, la, la. Yeah, don't listen. <laughs> bishop c8 is probably the best move. That way you defend your pawn, and you keep this pawn defended. Wait, check then, yeah, I will. Then, you're in an exchange slav down two tempi. It's a theoretical business, but you're down two tempi. So, and you only want to be down two tempi if you're in Arizona, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? Did that joke take off like a phoenix? No. Okay, because phoenix is you got it? in Arizona. What? They all got it. You guys all right? What? Yeah. I thought, I thought only you might get it, and then they have no hope. 
All right, let's see if Bishop C8 is the best move, or I'm crazy like Fox News, or both. Queen B6 sacrificing a pawn, E6 sacrificing a pawn. The computer's like, I'm not a pawn, I don't care. I'm guessing everything's for an hour. Oh, Bishop, here comes Bishop C8, here it comes. Yeah, it's gonna be number one if I let it sit forever. I have two CPUs, now it's Bishop C8. I have spoken. Okay, anyway, my opponent played the typical bad player's move. Queen D7? No, because knight E5. Ow! No, this, every bad player plays this move. They all do. Come on, you guys are bad players. Let's go. I'd probably play my knight out. What? No, you have to save your pawn. That's all you care about is your pawn. Oh, your pawn? That's all you care about. Oh, then I'm moving my queen over? Cause... No, because then you might lose this pawn. No. See, they're not bad enough. We need some worse players. Um, Anybody? No. B6. What? Okay. What? And now you don't lose anything. You save everything. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, b6 is terrible because the white bishop, you know, white square bishop isn't in here to defend. Now, I've had this position several times, and I've played different moves. e4 is actually a good move, but I play bishop g5 if I recollect. Do I recollect? I recollect I do. Okay. And the idea is obvious. I shouldn't even say it. There's a cartoon I watch. I think it's Futurama. Where the guy says, and now I'm, I'm gonna, a man who needs no introduction. And then he just sits down. Oh, yeah. Because he needs no introduction. So he didn't introduce him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take the knight, and then I'm going to take the pawn. Or as Yasser would say, and he said it about 800,000 times too many times, gift me the pawn. And then he laughs. After saying it like twice, that's enough. But the 900,000th time is coming up. There's the anniversary. Okay. Now he doesn't want to lose the pawn. So if I remember, he played bishop e6? Yeah, okay. It's hard to remember games from 26 years ago. I played either rook c1 or e3. Wow, what order did I play him then? Oh, I don't know. Darn. I think it's e3. I don't remember which order I played them in. I'll never remember. I'm searching back to the game. I think I played e3 first, like you said. Yes, okay. Then he played either a6 or knight bd7. I'm gonna say a6. Okay. Then I played rook c1, obviously. Okay, and now he made a, well, he's probably losing here already, because what's, what's this all about? What's happening here? How's that gonna get out? Okay, and, and what he did was, I think he wanted to play g6, bishop g7, because obviously this, this one's not moving. So he didn't want me to take his knight and mess his pawns up, so he played knight bd7. Okay, and that loses a pawn. Okay, and the reason it loses a pawn is because this pawn, which is attacked and defended, because I said so, it was defended by the knight, and now it's not. So by taking his knight on f6, he can't defend both of these pawns. Obviously, I'm threatening this pawn. The only way to save that pawn is to play which recapture? Knight takes their shit. Knight takes. That saves the d-pawn. Okay. But now I can safely take the a-pawn because if he takes it, I have queen b5 check, winning his rook. Okay. You, you agree? No? Yeah. You agree, right? No, because then the, if what? he takes the rook, then the queen will take. What? The queen's going to move like this? No, I'm saying if he takes my bishop, I'll check and win his rook. That's good for white, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, right. So now my move makes sense. Yes, it does. Now he's down a pawn, and he resigned. And I was very surprised he resigned, although it was my birthday. Oh, However, when I turned on the engine, and now it says I'm up like four or five po points. Now what's funny about this is, if I recollect, and I do, after rook takes, the engine doesn't play queen b5 check winning the rook. The engine says knight b5 is better. No. Yeah, because I'm threatening knight here check. And there's a lot of ways to stop it, except I don't see any. I do. Yeah? Resigning. <laughs> see, if I play knight check and you move your king out and I play the other knight check, the truth hurts. It's going to be really bad. <laughs> yeah, this is also, well, they're both winning. I would play queen b5. I never saw knight b5. And then he resigned here. If he plays the right move and doesn't take my bishop, he's still completely lost. He's like dead. 
because his king is horrible. He can't move his bishop. He's down a pawn. Here comes this diagonal. This is weak. My knight's coming in here. I got the file. These are never moving. Plus tax. And that guy was 2100. He did pretty good. He lasted past move 10. They're not impressed. All right. That was one of my favorite games from 92, my birthday. All right. What's that? Now you imagine that. Why are you always imagining stuff? Terrible. Children with such imagination. Okay. Now, let's see. That was in Europe. That was 92. I lost to Kaczynski. Oh, yeah. In Europe, I lost to him. Darn. Hate that guy. That game I blundered a pawn immediately. Now, I like this game because that guy needed a draw to get an international master norm. He offered me a draw move 10, and I declined, and then I tricked him at the end and beat him and took away his norm. And then I told my Dutch friends, it was in the Netherlands, I said, I beat a guy, he needed a draw for a norm, and they're like, yes, yeah, so? And I said, and he was German. Then they're like, oh, then it drinks all night. Yeah, because the Dutch love the Germans. Everybody loves the Germans. Okay, but the Dutch really love them. So we could look at that. Or we could, let's see, that is no good. That's no good. That's no good. I remember all of these games. This game I won on time. What kind of time frame are all these games typically? Are they all different? They're all, yeah, they're all slow chess. Well, the games all take three, four, five hours. Three or four, five hours? Yeah, the games all have really long. Okay, so this is my most famous game from 92. Let's look at that. You! Like the game, like something stone? Whatever. Ray Stone? Yeah. Um, I won on time. Were you, were you winning? Uh, well, that's a funny story. I won a pawn immediately. Like, I move eight. And then, like, nothing happened the rest of the game, and, like, my advantage was dissipating, and the spike fell. The time control, if I remember was 45 moves in two hours. Although well, it might have been 50 moves, oh no, in two and a half hours. I think it was 50 in two and a half. All right, now this is my most famous game, possibly ever. So look at this one, it was played in 92. This is against Jan de Boer. If you have a cold and can spit, you can say his name right. And this game's actually annotated by a Czech Grandmaster. He had to double check his analysis, right? Now, if he was a Dutch Grandmaster, he would get a jump rope because he would double Dutch his analysis, right? Yeah, she's like, she's like, yeah, of course. Okay, now, this game I showed to Victor Korshnoy the day after, and Bronstein and, and Korshnoy were like high-fiving me after the game because I was one of my better games, right? If they heard of Bronstein and Korshnoy, that would help. But, I did. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay, so let me explain this game to you. The round before, I played Patrick Wolf, who was U.S. champion at some point, twice. And it was a very boring draw in a Grunfeld. And the next round, I was like, rawr, no more boring chess. Because I like boring chess, but I already had a boring game. So this game wasn't going to be boring. So I sacrificed all my pieces, and it won the brilliancy prize for the chess festival. So I guess that was a good attitude. Okay, so we played the mainline Grunfeld. And in this position, he played a very unusual move. This position has occurred 100 billion times, and everybody plays c5. I mean, everybody does, okay? And he played b6, so that was the end of what I knew. I knew nothing. And this is like his preparation. I don't know the move b6. I still don't. Now, I told you what kind of mood I was in, right? So what would Ginger GM do? You. H4. Bam. Put it in H. Before Ginger GM was born, although I think he was born, but okay. And then bishop d5 pinning his knight. This is still his preparation. He knew this. I just thought I was making it up. But this had all been played before. Rawr! Bishop h6. Rawr! Okay, and this had all been played before. And even this had. Okay, this is a game played by Timon against somebody, and black won like three moves from here. And he actually knew that, but I didn't. I was thinking like an hour every move. Okay, so now, obviously his pieces are pretty active and my king is a little suspicious. I can't castle kingside, right Trudy? Yes. And now I can't castle queenside either. And then his queen's all over me, his knight and pawn are on me, his bishop is here, and my attack looks useless. So I play bishop d5, right? Yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna take that. Even you guys see that, right? Yes, yeah. okay, so he played bishop b7. 
Yeah, and now I played the most famous move in my chess career. You! Can you have one? That's probably better than my move. Oh, okay. Anybody at home, do you remember this game? Anyone? No? Okay, so I'll tell you how I found the move. I wanted to play queen h6 check. That looks pretty good, but my rook is there. So I could retreat my rook, there's a lot of retreating squares, and then play queen h6 check. However, if I retreat into some normal square, he plays rook h8, and that's the end of my ideas. You! And rook h4. Then he takes it. I know. So that's wrong. But you were close. You! Rook h4. Yeah. Okay, so I want to play queen h6 check because I said so. Now, I also want to play, not knight f5, knife f5. If he takes it with a pawn, rook g5 check wins his queen. Oh. No? Yeah. Can you say that again? Yeah. If he, if he, if he plays pawn takes knight, I play rook g5 check and win his queen. It's true. So I want to play knight f5, and I want to play queen h6. Now you guys are all wondering, what if he just takes the rook? It's good you wondered that because he did. Right? Yes. Bam! Now, there's no pawn on g6 because I said so. So, so now knife f5. Now, if I'm counting right, black has six legal moves. Queen takes isn't very good because I take his queen. King g6, I play queen h6 mate. Right? Mm -hmm. King g8, I play knight h6 check winning his queen. Yep. King h7 or king h8, doesn't matter which one, I check. And then I take this threatening mate and his bishop. Yeah. So that all that's terrible. What's the one move I didn't mention? King f6. King f6. That's what he played. Okay. Then I took his knight because, and the reason is now when I take his pawn, he can't play knight takes. Now he has to move his king up the board. Actually, he could play king e6 and run away. And he could run all the way over here. I think white's slightly better there. If he takes my knight, then I go checkmate, which is good for white. Right, Shooty? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so he's like, whatever, I'll just take the pawn. And I'm like, come to papa. And that movie wasn't even made yet. Queen d4 check. So what looks safer to you, king e6 or king f4? King e6. King e6. So it's king f4, I can win his queen by going check, and then after here, he has to play queen takes knight, because there's no other legal move that I take his queen. If he plays king g5, white has a slight advantage. Mate. Okay, so king f4 is unacceptable. I played f3, breaking my rule. Never play f3, but I defend my pawn, and I can castle. So that does a couple of things. He played queen g2, obviously. But you already had the pawn in front of the moves. What? But if you castled the pawn in front of it, we've already been moving, you should have the pawn in front of it. Exactly. I know what she means. Yeah, yeah. I know what she means. Okay, now I checked. Now he has three moves. King f6, which makes no sense. King d7 or king e5. This makes no sense. I take a check. Then if you go here, I meet you. So probably that's bad. Right? Okay, so king d7 is okay, then I castle with check, and then I play here, and obviously white's looking pretty good. I'm threatening this, I'm threatening knight d6, I'm threatening etc. Okay, so he played king e5, and I took. And now he made the losing move. And... What he should do is just keep checking me. Queen g1, queen g2. And if I want to win, I have to run my king up the board too like him. So it looks like we're playing in a junior tournament. Okay? Or I could go back and forth and draw, or I could try to win. He thought he was winning, so he didn't want to draw. Why would you want to draw if you're winning? Yeah. He's like, well, I'm winning. So he played the move that he thought won. He played queen f3. That is okay? move. And he saw I would go check. Now, obviously, king e6, king e6, I checkmate him. If you don't like that variation, 
I can check me another way if you if you didn't if you didn't like the other one. Okay. If he plays king here, king f6. <sighs> what are the variations? Oh, that's right, king here, and then I win the queen. Okay, so you play king takes e4, and he thought all was well with the world. He's like, I'm winning. I'm up the exchange in two pawns. Ben's knight is hanging. This rook is doing Vishwa nothing. Then I got no problem. Then I made the move that he missed. He saw every move except the one that I made here. This is a move people miss a lot because people don't see retreats. They see moves going forward. Retreating moves they're not afraid of. Breaking my rule, always retreat. I get a parry because I retreated. You! Knight g3 check. He didn't see that. Now he has a problem. His king can't go to a lot of squares. A lot of squares. They're illegal. Right? If he goes to this square, queen here check wins his queen with a skewer. Now you know what a skewer is. Yes. All right. So he played king to d3. If he plays king to e3, the only move I didn't discuss, then I have this checkmate. You all agree? Yes. I remember all the variations just in case. Just in case I have to show somebody. Okay. So he played king d3, and I checked. Now, king c2 is the same mate we looked at. King e3 is also the same mate. Queen d2 mate. If you don't like it, queen d4 mate. King c3 falls into the skewer of his queen, right? So he played king c4. King c4. Okay. Now he plays king d3. It's the same mate I keep showing you. Right? So you play king d5. And finally, finally, I get my other piece into the attack. Bam! Okay, and now king e6 is made in one. So that's bad. And king c4 is made in a few. Check, check, mate. That was king c6, not king c4. Yeah, but queen c4. Okay, so he took my rook, and finally I'm ahead material. The funny thing about this game was, his last move was a blunder, and it was the best move. That's when you know you're a good player, when your blunders are the best moves. Okay, So the game went on. He was in really bad time trouble. If only you knew how much time trouble he was in. Now, you guys don't care about time trouble because you have an electronic clock. It tells you how much time you have, and you get a delay, and somebody's massaging your shoulders. Back then, we had the analog clocks confusing the children. And so we didn't know when our flag was going to fall. Surprise, you lose. So when you had like 10, 20 seconds left, you were moving fast. Because any move your flag could fall and you lose. You probably know what I'm talking about, but yeah. I know what I'm talking about. I, I, I had a lot of grandmasters lose on time to me, and they're like, what? I thought I had time. And I'm like, yes. Right. For example, Julian Hodgson, your favorite British grandmaster. He was number three or four in Britain. He, he quit chess because he teaches in schools now and... Bring, brings home the pound sterling. Okay. Um, he had made in three against me. Check, check, mate. And when he was executing it, his flag fell on move 40. So I win. Right? And there's a comic you never heard of called Chessman Comics. It's the funniest thing that's ever happened on the earth. There's two issues. It's really funny. Everything's a joke. It's really funny jokes. And every game Chessman wins is very suspicious like that. His opponent has mate. He's playing one of these child prodigies, and the guy's standing on like six books to reach the pieces, and they're all like books like Einstein made hard, because it's too easy for him. And then the kid loses on time because he can't reach the piece. He's too short. He wins every game like that. That's how, that's how Chessman wins. I win some games like that. Chessman's the funniest thing ever. It's written by John Watson, who's an American international master, but he wrote it 35 years ago, so 40 years ago. Probably you can get it on Amazon or eBay or somewhere, but it's hilarious. Chessman wins again. Uh, I'll tell you another game that Chessman won because I can't, I can't stop thinking about it. Something you guys don't know about is called adjourned games. So a game would go for several hours and they would stop the game and play later. That was common. So Chessman's playing and he's getting crushed. And his opponent is Italian and see, you have to seal a move. You write a move and put it in the envelope. Then when the game is resumed, they take it out of the envelope and play the move you keep playing. If you seal an illegal move, you lose. This, is, this has happened. Anyway, his opponent, being Italian, was writing a love letter at the time, and he sealed the love letter instead of the move. 
So when they opened it, it's this letter, so he loses. And it said, his opponent argued that everlasting love was equal to pawn promotion, but the director denied it. And kids think it's really funny. Okay. Anyway, the game concluded. Oh, by the way, when you watch uh, chess in the movies and television, one guy says check and his opponent responds with check. Like in real life. That actually happened here. I put him in check and he put me in check. Bam, you don't see that too often, do you? Yeah, Ish don't think so. Okay. Okay, so this is the funny part of the game. Here I played the best move. It's the move you would all play, except you two wouldn't play it. Archer might play it. What's the best move for Wyatt? King F3. Mm hmm. That's why you're Archer. F3 King F3. Check. Is it worth D3 check? Right. Now I'm threatening mate and one, mate and one, mate and one. And both of these moves are mate and two by going to one square, then the other, which is a very funny Futurama quote. Oh, yeah. And I forgot what the temperature was, but they were like on the moon. It says, man, when the sun goes down, it's going to get really cold here. It's going to be 50 below zero. And then one of them says, Fahrenheit or Celsius. And the guy says, first one, then the other. Okay. So I could play queen g4, then queen g2, or queen g2, then queen g4. Anyway, how do you stop all those mates? He did it. What did he do? He played rook d3, the computer move. That's the best move. You know why he played it? Why? He didn't see queen takes rook. So I took his rook, and he's like, oh. So he resigned. But turns out that was still the best move. Good job. Otherwise, it's mate in two. So if it's mate in three, that's a better move, technically? The computer will play rook d3 all day and then some. Rook d3, easily the best move. Yeah, but I like the way he didn't see his rook was hanging. That's why he played it. Yeah. He's in time trouble. Yeah. Now his time trouble ended for two reasons. It's move 40 and he gave up. So good reason, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then we spent the rest of the year trying to pronounce the guy's name. We ended the game. We gave up. I told Michael Adams in 1988, if you can't pronounce your opponent's name, he's really good. So be careful. That's why Michael Adams never became world champion. Michael Adams, come on, right? You can't say either of Anand's names, right? Well, you can't say Fufu's. That's right. <laughs> right? What's, An what's Anand's name? Richard And she's Indian. Sure. Wow, that's embarrassing. You mispronounced it so badly. Good job. Sure. Yeah. And, and, so that's why he was world champion several times. I demand Fufu. You demand Fufu. Wow. <laughs> okay. So that was my game of Khert Jan de Boer. And as an adult, you've heard of the Boer Wars you know, in South Africa. Mm. What does de Boer mean in Dutch? Diamonds. Close. Farmer. Farmer. Yeah, he's a farmer. Yeah. So that was my game. I showed it to Korshnoi. He said, good job. High five me on the flip side. Man, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So that won the brilliancy prize for the Vikonze Chess Festival, which had like a million grandmasters playing, which was 500 guilders. Very embarrassing how much that is. It's like $250 for a brilliancy prize for the whole chess festival. What? So I sacked my rook. I mated him later. When the game ended, we analyzed it and I won. And then Patrick Wolf said, was that the greatest thing ever or was it was lucky? And I said, I don't know. Then we had dinner in the Italian restaurant with Yasser Sarawan and others. And we were eating. And I said, Yasser, did you see my game? And he said, no. So I told him my game while we were eating. So I said the game out loud. He did it in his head. His analysis was better than ours after the game in his head without seeing the game. He said, well, can your opponent go here? And what about here? And what about this? Those variations were added into the notes. The ones where Yasser wasn't looking at the board. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good move. I'll have to write that down. Yeah. So he was lucky like a grandmaster. They're always lucky. Yeah. Now, if I told you this game while you were eating, never saw it, you would give variation after variation. You couldn't stop. You'd be like, waiter, stop bringing me food. I'm talking about variations here. Man, that place was great. That Italian restaurant was really good. Now, they had this, you know when you get like butter with your bread? They had like this garlicky kind of butter. Man, that was good. The truth hurts. I can't have that anymore. <laughs> I have to write a book. Don't be vegan like a grandmaster. Right? Yeah. What? All right. So that was the year 1992. I remember very little of it. I can't remember anything that happened that year. 
You just told us stuff that happened that year. You could tell me stuff that happened in 1992. Now, even though I'm sort of kidding. Okay, let's let's take you. You were alive in the year 2002, right? Yeah. yeah name some stuff that happened then. In 2002. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. He's like, I don't know. I was alive. I think in '92 there was a blizzard in Atlanta. In '92. '93. Yeah, we got like a foot of snow. In How old were you? Eight or nine. Yep. A foot of snow in Atlanta. It was crazy. Like Fox News. No, Fox News wasn't around then. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, you're right. See, I thought I made the joke crazy like Fox News up. Then I saw it on Futurama. <laughs> and I was like, what? I stole a joke I thought I made up? Now, what's crazy about that is Futurama is set in the year 3000. You guys think Fox News would be around 3000? As we say in Germany. I think they just no. got bought out. They, ish, ish don't think so. I think they just got bought out. What, today? No, I mean, in the last couple of weeks, or there's something going on. Some, there's yeah. something that's just like... Are they buying Sky News? They'll be called CNN News. Yeah, I think they bought Sky. Yeah. Yeah, or something. I don't but know. I think the guy owns them both. You. Didn't you technically make it up first because Futurama is set in the year three thousand? Nice. Yeah, he's correct. All right, mm -hmm. stay tuned for next class, but don't stay tuned. And as Gene Wilder likes to say, so he doesn't watch my lectures. Class. Class is dismissed. dismissed. You 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 never see him Frankenstein? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah. No, you gotta see it. Like, I see it? Yeah, of course. Is that a comedy? Yeah. Is that the one with the. Is that comedian the big. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, shit. No, what? No, is it Mel Brooks? Like it yeah. Dog. Yeah. Like it Let's dog. see. We'll do this and we'll call it 8 5 18 1 hike. Is that right? No. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's not. Right. Can 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 you like grandmasters and you guys really like just visualize whole games just based yeah. on notations? Is that pretty Good. common? Yeah. Um, class dismissed. All right, now pay attention. Okay. This is the only part of the class that matters. Okay. <laughs> He's teaching a class. He's a Last professor. Just before we leave. Uh, Recognizing Willy Wonka. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Frankenstein. Yes. Isn't it true that Darwin preserved a piece of vermicelli in a glass case until, by some extraordinary means, it actually began to move with a voluntary motion? Are you speaking of the worm or the spaghetti? <laughs> Why the worm, sir? Yes. It seems to me I did read something of that incident when I was a student. But you have to remember that a worm, with very few exceptions is not a human being. <laughs> but wasn't that the whole basis of your grandfather's work, sir? The reanimation of dead tissue? My grandfather was a very sick man. But as a Frankenstein, aren't you the least bit curious about it? Doesn't the bringing back to life what was once dead hold any intrigue for you? You are talking about the nonsensical ravings of a lunatic mind. Dead is dead. But look at what has been done with hearts and kidneys. Hearts and kidneys are tinker toys. I'm talking about the central nervous system. But sir, I am a scientist, not a philosopher. You have more chance of reanimating a scalpel than you have of mending a broken nervous system. But what about your grandfather's work, sir? My grandfather's work was doo-doo. I am not interested in death. The only thing that concerns me is the preservation of life. Oh, I knew this would be right. <laughs> Class is uh, dismissed. <laughs> now, if you go here, Class. No, like here. I'm interested in death. You can see he's got something here to make sure he doesn't die. Yeah. Like his leg's really big here. Yeah. yeah like yeah. here, he just has a leg. There, there's something happening. <laughs> so he has some protection because. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they didn't want him to actually do it. Yeah. If he actually did, that'd be great acting. Yeah, like right. They put something there so that he wouldn't die. Yeah, that was good prep. Yeah. Yeah, like in movies when they do like ketchup packs or something. The only thing that concerns me is the preservation of life. <laughs> Class is. Hello.
Well, that was cool though. So all this stuff is you can check out the schedules and like the tournaments.